I have a couple of questions for you today. First one is, are you holy? <laughs> Do you even want to be holy? Would you like people calling you holy? Would you say you are holy? Or would you be reticent to do so and say, no, no, holy and holiness and holy people, that, that, that's for someone else. Do you accept that you're holy or do you feel like that's not you? So what is it? Is being holy even important for you? When was the last time you even heard a sermon on being holy? I gave a last, my last one was about six years ago. <laughs> And I think if I was to ask people to help me uh, with sermons on this website, and I said, I'd like you to talk on holiness or being holy, I'll bet you I wouldn't get a real strong response from people saying they'd love to do one on holiness. Now, I, I hope this will get your attention, though. Hebrews 12, verse 14 says, Pursue peace with all people and holiness, without which no one will see the Lord. Pursue peace with all people and holiness, without which no one will see the Lord. You're not going to see God. You're not going to see Christ. You're not going to be there watching him and seeing him and talking to him and seeing his face and him seeing your face unless you and I are holy. Have I got your attention now? You won't be there. You won't be in God's kingdom unless you're holy. Do you want to see God? Forget it if you're not holy. I hope that draws your attention. So hello everyone and welcome to Light on the Rock. I'm Philip Shields, the host. I encourage you all to browse around the website. Uh, you go down to the search bar on the homepage and as it has hundreds of blogs and sermons and, uh, and videos that we've posted already. So um, check it out. Check out our website. Welcome to us, uh, to our website. Uh, consider that your website. Anyway, frankly, I've been sobered by taking on this subject. I always start my sermons and Bible studies as a study for my own self. Uh, I've been punched hard in the gut as I've been preparing this. Uh, God sort of telling me, Philip, you yourself, you need to get back into really understanding the calling I've given you, the high calling. I called you out of the muck and, uh, and the sins of your past. And you can't be sliding into anything else in the past or present. You just can't. You're a holy child of mine. And I'm, I'm talking to all of you. I think many of God's children, many of us, are starting to get lukewarm, uh, shallow, taking it easy on the less than holy lives that many of us have going on in our lives. God's children, God's children, you and I, have been called to be holy children, holy children of God. You need to really understand this topic, and I hope today's sermon will help. Um, this topic, even though it may not rank up there as the most interesting topics, it really should rank up there as one of the most vital ones because without holiness, Hebrews 12, 14, let's stick it up there again. Hebrews 12, 14, without holiness, you and I aren't e even going to be there. Now, Pentecost is coming up real soon, the end of this month in, two, in 2020. And uh, God's, uh, Pentecost is coming up and God's children received a down payment or earnest of the Holy Spirit in Acts 2 on this very day. A very earnest or, or a down payment of God's own presence. God's own presence. His very being, His own Holy Spirit. So I think the topic of holiness is very, very critical right now. By the way, I have a sermon in the audio section of my homepage. Just go down and scroll down a little bit to audio. And uh, there's, a, there's a sermon there I've given before called Your Wilderness Time. During this time, Israel was uh, right in the time we're in now, right after Passover and they left Egypt. They're now in the time when they're in the wilderness, they're wandering their way or going on their way to Mount Sinai. And uh, then they had 40 years of in the wilderness. Right now, we're in the wilderness sometimes. And so uh, I, I think that's a good topic for you as well. And so anyway, I think with the coronavirus pandemic going on too, I don't know. You don't know how much time, how, how many years are left. I, it's got to be more than three to five years because maybe seven more years at least because of things that have to happen according to Scripture. So I'm not saying Christ is returning tonight or anything like that. But at the same time, this pandemic going on, even our president has called it the plague several times, the plague. In many cases, we'll be separated physically only from our churches. 
We won't be sitting there next to each other, which we'd like to be, and soon we'll be again. But right now, we're keeping separation. We're getting rid of the plague. It's a plague on our country like nobody's ever seen. But we're winning the battle. We're winning the war. We'll be back together in churches right next to each other. Celebrate. Bring the family together like no other. We have a lot to be thankful for. So I think with him calling it the plague, I, I, this plague may be, this virus may be just the first of a series of uh, pestilences that God will send to us to wake us up. Um, this one may go away, but then another wave, another wave, another wave, another wave of different ones. Maybe another wave of this one. And so uh, just get ready for the end time as we are in the time of what the, our own president is calling a plague. So we have to wake up. The time before Christ returns could be very, very short. So we're talking about being holy. We'll cover in this two-part series, a two-part sermon, uh, why we need it. And one reason we've already seen, without it, we're not even going to be in the kingdom of God. And who are the ones the Bible refers to as holy? Hopefully you're part of that group of ones who are called holy. What does holy even mean? What does holy even mean? Could, if, I, if I just ask you right now to, to get up here uh, on camera and you explain holy means, or the definition of holy is, or the Hebrew, the Greek word was this and it meant this, I'd love to welcome you up here. Uh, we need to know what holy means. It doesn't mean sinless. It doesn't mean you're absolutely perfect and never ever fail any time at all. It doesn't mean that. So what does it mean? Can formerly very evil people ever be holy? And when does one become holy? And how, most importantly perhaps, how? How do we become holy? Do you know how? This matter of holiness is so misunderstood. So many resist the concept. And um, if someone said to you, oh, you're so holy, or you think you're so holy, you know, if you're trying to do something right, or you point something out to some people, hey, come on, guys, we shouldn't be doing this. Uh, you're likely to get a comment like that. Oh, you think you're just so holy. It's not a positive comment, unfortunately, and it should be. It should be. 1 Peter 1, verses 15 and 16. Let's put it up there. At least I think it's verse 15. As he who has called you is holy, you should also be, you also shall be holy in all your conduct, because it is written, be holy, for I am holy. It's written, be holy, for I am holy. So Peter is quoting from Leviticus 11 right here, saying that we should all be holy. Now, when I say the words holy man, he is a holy man or a holy woman. What picture conjures up in your mind right away? Uh, you could probably Google holy men uh, video or, or just say uh, uh, images of, you know, pictures of holy men, holy women, and see what comes up. It's rather interesting. And maybe we'll post a few here while I'm talking about it. Do you ever see a depiction of someone who's called a holy person, a holy man, having a good time? Do you ever see them, I don't know, with roller skates on or, or riding a bike or, or <laughs> riding a horse with a big smile on their face? Do you ever see a holy man depicted in oil paintings as having a glass of beer or a glass of wine in his hand with a big smile on his face, uh, sitting down or standing up or dancing at a, at a, big, at a big festive uh, wedding party, let's say? I doubt you ever have. Uh, there may be a picture like that out there, and if we can find one, we'll post it. But they're rare. Most of the pictures of holy men and women are very dour, very serious. They might have a halo around their head, you know, uh, but, but you'd never see them cutting up, or laughing, having a good time. And so, yeah, I know there are a lot of scriptures that talk about being sober and redeeming the time and uh, uh, not having uh, revelries and uh, orgies and things like that. So that's not what I'm uh, talking about when I talk about it, cutting up, having a good time. Don't forget in Matthew 11, verse 19, that Yeshua himself, Jesus Christ, Yeshua is his Hebrew name that his mama called him. He, while he was a man here on earth, liked his wine. He liked his parties. He liked his feasts. He liked to party. His first 
miracle that we're told of in Acts, I'm, I'm sorry, in John, I believe, John chapter 2, is at the wedding feast of Cana. And what did he do? He multiplied the wine. But what does it say in Matthew eleven nineteen? Matthew eleven nineteen. 19, the Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say, look, the Son of Man, Yeshua, Jesus Christ, came eating and drinking, and they say, look, a glutton and a wine-bibber. Boy, he likes his drink. A glutton. He's eating too much. He's drinking too much. He's a friend, in fact, of sinners. What a horrible group of people to be associated with, they're saying. But wisdom is justified <laughs> by her children. So he's saying, I, John the Baptist didn't come eating and drinking, and they said he's got a demon or something wrong with him. I come eating and drinking, and they say something's wrong with him. <laughs> and so uh, Yeshua apparently liked to drink enough, eat enough, that he could have that accusation be made. So the very Son of God, the holiest of all people who've ever walked this earth, had a good time sometimes. I know he was a man acquainted with sorrow, but they, he, he consumed enough alcohol that he was considered a wine bibber. His first miracle, after they had consumed all the wine they already had for this wedding party, was to make dozens and dozens of gallons more of wine. And that pictured, by the way, was around the Passover time, that pictured that he'd have plenty of grace for those of us who are sinners. The wine, the red wine, pictured his blood. It was wine. It wasn't fruit juice. It was wine. <laughs> Believe me, the head of a wedding party, the governor of the party, would never have said, uh, you've, you've reserved the best to last when he brings out Welch's grape juice. No, that's not what he brought out. So there's a balance. We refrain from orgies and revelry, but we can enjoy a good time. God and his son are happy people, are happy beings. Psalm 16, verse 7. Psalm 16, verse 7 says, You will show me the path of life, and your presence is fullness of joy. Psalm 16, 7. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Do you ever equate God as being, a, or being around God as a time of pleasure forevermore? Do you equate being around your Creator as being the fullness of joy? He is holy. My point that I'm trying to get at right at the outset is forget what you've heard about being holy. Holy can be fun. Holy can be wonderful. Do you, do you see that? So one reason you may not wish to be considered holy is that I think you've had the wrong impressions all along. I'm not talking about at all the holiness movements in the 1800s and 1900s. I, I, I'm not. Neither am I talking about the mental images of the present holy men, you know, the Pope or the Dalai Lama, people call him a holy man, or the fat-bellied Buddha, you know, outside in the garden. I mean, what's with that? I mean, the images of Christ, you know, on the cross, at least we bring him indoors. But we put the fat-bellied Buddha out in the garden with the sprinklers, with the, with the little statue of the little boy peeing, you know. <laughs> it's, we shouldn't be doing that. But anyway, the Pope is referred to as the Holy Father. And when Yeshua clearly said, don't be using titles and words like Holy Father. Uh, Yeshua used the, the, the phrase Holy Father in John 17 while he was talking to his Father in heaven. And he said Holy Father within John 17, I think at least once, several times. And so um, men should not be taking those titles. He says so in Matthew 23. We'll try to post it up here. Matthew 23 verses 8 to 12 but you do not be called rabbi. So what do we do? We have all kinds of people calling themselves rabbi. Rabbi, I guess, means teacher. But in, in, its, uh, in its word picture, it, it means great one. Don't be doing that. One is your teacher, the Christ, the Messiah. You're all brethren. Hey, you're all brothers. Don't be exalting yourself above someone else. So that's why I go by Philip. I don't. People call me Mr. Shields. I always say, just call me Philip. We're all brothers. I never called my brother... Mr. Shields. I never did. I always called him by his first name. Don't call anyone on earth, Matthew 23, verse 9, anyone on earth your father, especially not holy father. And he's talking about here spiritual terms. Obviously, you have a dad, uh, but, but to call someone father. So what's, what does the Catholic Church do? All the priests are called father. <laughs> you know, it shouldn't be. One is your father, and he's in heaven. And don't be called teachers. One's your teacher, the Christ. But he who's greatest among you shall be your servant. So forget all the wrong mental images of holy and holy people, okay? Or fake religious leaders. 
And herein also is a misunderstanding. Being holy, being holy does not, I've said this already, does not mean you're flawless, does not mean in your conduct and, and actions and thoughts. The reason I know that, and we'll read some verses on it in just a minute, the Corinthian church was riddled with problems. And yet, you know what? Paul referred to them as the Hagioi, uh, the, the Hagios, the Hagioi, the Holy Ones, saints, was translated saints. So, um, anyway, so we'll, um, we'll be talking about what's the meaning of holiness, who alone is holy, who besides God is called holy. Okay, in the second part, uh, we'll be talking more about some of those things, how you lose your holiness. But today, let's talk about holiness. So we just read that without holiness, you and I won't see the Lord. Uh, Hebrews 12, 14. 1 John 3, verse 2 does say that we will see God, God the Father, as He is. We shall be like Him, and we shall see Him as He is. 1 John 3, verse 2. Now, what does holy mean then? Pause for a minute. Write down what you think it means. Well, I'm kind of hesitating here. Holy means, just if you're taking notes, I hope you are, uh, or in your mind at least, what does holy mean? What does holiness mean? In the Old Testament, the, the main, Greek, uh, the main uh, Hebrew word is kadosh, Q-A-D-O-S-H, sometimes K-A-D-O-S-H, kadosh. We always lose uh, some nuance when we're translating, but the primary meaning from the Hebrew kadosh is set apart for holy use. It's similar to the word, it's not the same word, but similar to the word sanctify. Set apart for holy use. In the New Testament, the Greek word is hagios, uh, which also refers to something devoted and set apart or dedicated to holy use by God or to God, to his holiness, to be godlike. It represents people who have separated themselves from the ways of the world and from sin and have consecrated themselves to God. You've all heard of the Nazarites and how they had to take certain vows of consecration in a way, though we're not Nazarites, we're allowed to grow our hair. And right now during the pandemic, I've had to give myself a haircut, so don't, don't be, you know, just myself. <laughs> it, was, it was getting out here. So anyway, um, I'm allowed to cut my hair, but what I'm getting at is the Nazarites devoted their lives to God. And so that's why when Samson cut his hair, uh, or told Delilah that if you want me to lose my power, my strength from God, cut off my hair. I'll talk more about that perhaps in the second part. And that had a very distinct meaning to God when he disregarded that. Uh, he was set apart. But God didn't take away his power when he got drunk or when he committed adultery or fornication or touched dead animals, all of which a Nazarite's not allowed to ever do. So something was going on with the hair, and I'll talk about that if I remember for next time. But anyway, uh, hagios means someone devoted, separated, severed from the rest of the world, but, but we still live among them. Like John 17, Yeshua says, uh, they're not of the world, though I send them into the world. So um, separated, set apart, uh, very, very deep meaning to it. Uh, so now some groups even say the word set apart whenever you read the word holy. So Holy Spirit becomes a set-apart spirit, or holy people are the set-apart people, because holy does have that distinct meaning of being set-apart, separated for holy use. And Hagios has a similar meaning as well, devoted, set-apart, dedicated to God in His holy use. Um, I'm going to post some, maybe a lot of notes in here from Vine's Expository Dictionary, of biblical words and so you can study that yourself a little further if you want to but um, holy is very significant to God so we also have now God's indwelling presence so now as we come to uh, Pentecost if I say Passover I mean Pentecost okay <laughs> just and we need to be set apart for holy use in 2nd Corinthians 6 I want to read this passage to you 2 Corinthians 6, verses 16 to 18. I just dropped one of my notes pages, and uh, but I'll try to wing it here and do, do the best. God's Spirit will help me, I hope. 
Anyway, so um, 2 Corinthians 6, verses 16 to 18. When you wake up in the morning, do you ever think, God is inside of me. Jesus Christ, Messiah, Yeshua, the Messiah, and his Father, our, my Holy Father, are inside of me. Where do I take them? What do I make them watch? What do I make them hear? What do I make them view in my daily life with my wife, my husband, my children, my neighbors? Where do I go? Two can't walk together lest they be agreed. Two can't walk together unless they be agreed. And so if we're doing things, seeing things, hearing things, going places, conversing in a way not holy, not compatible with our holy God, at some point he begins to leave. So that's why King David even says, we'll talk more about this part of it next, next time, where even King David says, take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore a right spirit within me. Create in me a clean heart. Because he knows that in the time between killing Uriah, between the time of even the adultery, then the killing of Uriah, He's probably losing a lot of God's Holy Spirit. Take not your Holy Spirit from me, he says in Psalm 51. So let's read this in 2 Corinthians 6, verses 16 to 18. This topic of holiness, I just got to tell you, is so important. It's so important. What agreement has the temple of God with idols? You see, some of the Corinthians were still sometimes messing around with idols. For you are the temple of the living God. Forget about the temple of Zeus. Forget about the temple of Diana of the Ephesians. Forget about the temple of anybody else, uh, uh, Athena or anybody else. And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk among them. I'm reading 2 Corinthians 6. Verse 16, I will be their God. They shall be my people. So right away, God's saying, hey, you're the temple of my presence. I'm living inside of you. So what are you doing with unholy things, unholy conduct? That's why I say I've had to even repent myself. And that's why I hesitated even making this sermon. I don't want people calling me a hypocrite. I, I don't. I need to be holy as well. But we, like Paul, sometimes stumble and do things we don't like or, or think things we don't like. So we've got to, got to, got to wake up. Verse 17, therefore come out from among them and be separate. There you go. Be holy. Be separate, says the Lord. Don't touch what's unclean. You know why? Because something holy, touching something unclean, makes the holy thing unholy. Okay, you get that? I'll, I'll try to maybe even put, there's a verse in the Old Testament in Hosea or someplace that talks about that, that if something's holy and it touches something unholy, what happens? Well, the holy becomes unclean. The only exception to that was when holy son of God, Yeshua, would touch the lepers and, and so forth. He made them clean rather than making him unclean. But normally for the rest of us, if we touch and get involved in the unclean, it makes us unclean. So I will be a father to you and you shall be my sons and daughters. So do you feel, do you see, do you experience this true holiness? It's really all about God and being separated to him and being a part of him, dedicated to him to live a clean and a consecrated life. It doesn't mean you can't have fun anymore. You can still have your beer and your wine, but don't get drunk. You can still laugh, but don't have an orgy. You could enjoy intimate relations with your wife, with your husband, but not someone else. Not even in your mind. But you can have very good fun with your wife or your husband and your children. You can have fun things you're doing with your children. So let's turn now to Revelation 15. Who is holy? How do we become holy? Let's talk about that. Revelation 15, verses 2 to 4, I saw something like a sea of glass mingled with fire. This is up in heaven. 
Revelation 15, verse 2, And those who have the victory over the beast, over his image, and over his mark, and over the number of his name, standing on the sea of glass, having harps of God, they sing the song of Moses, a servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are your ways, are your works, O Lord God Almighty. Boy, I think of a song right now. Just and true are your ways, O King of the saints, O King of the holy ones. Who shall not fear you, O Lord, and glorify your name? For you alone are holy. For you alone are holy. For all nations shall come and worship before you, for your judgments have been manifested. You alone are holy. Now part of God is also the Son of God, who is also God. John 1 says that. The Word was with God, the Word was God, the Word is God. The Word is also called the one who also says he was the one who was and is and is to come, which is also said of God the Father. And so they are as one. They are God and they are holy. And their spirit that they give to us is holy. And uh, so that's part of God. So um, ultimately only God himself is truly, perfectly holy. And only God, because he's holy, can impart holiness. This is a critical thing to understand. David extols the holiness of God over and over again in the Psalms, and I'll put some down in the notes. In Yah's throne room, in Isaiah 6, verse 3, the seraphs, the seraphim, when you have an I-M, it's a, the plural of seraphs in English, the seraphim there are, have six wings. Let's read what it says. In Isaiah 6, in the, in the year that the king Uzziah died, I saw Jehovah sitting on a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple, and above it stood seraphim. Each one had six wings, with two they covered the face, with two they covered the feet, and with two they flew. And one cried out to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is Jehovah of hosts. Holy, holy, holy. The whole earth is full of his glory. So Isaiah was so affected by this that he said, as he was viewing this, that he kind of lost it. He says, I'm done, I'm doomed, I'm ruined, I'm undone, whatever, as the next verse says. So when we come into the perfect holiness, the presence of perfect holiness, we tend to see our own rottenness. When Peter came to realize that Yeshua and his boat was the Son of God, he said, depart from me, for I'm an evil man. So that, that same thing that Isaiah has here. And then uh, Sarah, or one of the angels, came and put a hot coal on his lips and cleansed him because he said, I'm a man of unclean lips. I've got to stop using these F words. I've got to stop using profanity. I've got to stop using God's name in vain, is what Isaiah is saying. And this man, Isaiah, who, who wrote such a beautiful book, um, it has so many beautiful passages in it, apparently was a filthy mouth person. When God worked with him and called him and cleaned him up. And God will clean you up and God will clean me up as well. The scenes repeated for, by the four living creatures in Revelation 4 verse 8. Revelation 4 verse 8, the four living creatures, each one having six wings. These are the seraphim. Were full of eyes and all around and within. And they don't rest day or night. 24-7 they say, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. That's just a long way of saying who's eternal, who's always been, always will be. So who is holy? Yeshua tells us when we pray, Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy name. Uh, or as the uh, uh, complete Jewish Bible puts it, may your name be kept holy. As the Holman translation, may your name be honored as holy. Because the name of God, Yehovah, or even just to say our heavenly Father, that's a holy holy reference to him. David in Psalm 111 says, holy and reverend is your name, is his name. So all holiness, my point here is to say that all holiness, true holiness, ultimately rests with God the Father and the Son and, um, and through their Holy Spirit. And so uh, we know that uh, even Yeshua uh, in, in, in Psalm 1610, the psalmist says in a prophecy about Christ's resurrection, Psalm 1610, we should probably put this on the board if, you, if we can. Nor will you let your Holy One see corruption. Peter and Paul both said that referred to Yeshua, to Jesus Christ. 
And uh, in Psalm 16 and verse 10, he is called your Holy One. You won't leave him in Sheol, you won't leave him in the grave, in death, nor will you allow him to see corruption. Now Mary also was told by an angel in Luke 1.35, the Holy One who is to be born from you will be the Son of God. And I'm just making the point with clear verses that you alone are holy when it says that in Revelation 15.4, uh, that refers to all that is God. And Yeshua is also God. It would be wrong for any angel to worship him. Hebrews 1.6, God the Father orders all angels, you worship my son. And they did, even at his birth. Even the wise men said, we've come to worship him who's been born king of the Jews. And so uh, Mary is told in Luke 1.35, the Holy One who is to be born from you, the Holy One, will be the Son of God. Daniel 9 prophesies uh, the time of the Messiah would be a time to anoint the Most Holy. And you know, I hope, that Messiah or Christ in the Greek, Messiah, Messiah in the, from Hebrew, uh, means anointed one. So God the Father and the Son are both holy, most holy. So who else is called holy? But true holiness ultimately starts and ends with, with God. But, but how, do, how does anybody or anything else become holy? In 1 Thessalonians 5.27, it says, I charge you by the Lord that this epistle be read to all the holy brethren. Any of you who check in your own other Bibles, NIV, the Living Bible, the English Standard Version, the American Standard Version, the CJB, the Holman, or any other modern translation other than King James and New King James, omit the word holy. There's They omit so many hundreds and hundreds of places. So many hundreds of words are omitted from those translations. So I, I, tend, to, I tend to keep to King James or New King James. There's another verse anyway that says the brethren are holy. That is in the other translations. Hebrews 3, verse 1. Hebrews 3, verse 1. Therefore, holy brethren, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our confession, Christ Jesus. And then the part you know so well in 1 Peter 2, verse 9. 1 Peter 2, verse 9. You are a chosen generation, pulled out from the rest. Remember when God says to Israel, I didn't choose you because you were the greatest, the smartest, the best, the holiest. No, I just chose you because I chose you. Not for any reason of what anything you've done. So he says they chose. Now, now this is transferring to the ones who are called spiritually a chosen generation, a royal priesthood. Your royalty and your holy people, priests, a holy nation, his own special people that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Do we realize we can't just be a closet believer? We can't just stay in the doldrums or out in the closets and never letting anybody have any idea that we really are children of God, that we're holy people, that we like being a child of God. We want to be uh, thought of as a holy person. So change your concepts. If you think you don't want that, then you're not going to be in the kingdom. 1 Peter 2, verse 5. Going back a few verses. 1 Peter 2, verse 5. So we're a holy priesthood now serving under the high priesthood of Melchizedek, priesthood order of Melchizedek, of Yeshua, the Messiah, the Son of God, our Lord, and our God. 1 Peter 2, 5. You also, as living stones, are being built up to a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, in Ephesians, it says that uh, you are uh, uh, being built up into a temple, a living temple, the habitation of God himself. But here it says a holy priesthood, um, a spiritual house, okay, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God. So now even the less than perfect Corinthians and so many other brethren were called holy ones. Hagioi, or something like that in Greek, or Hagioi, or Hagioi, I don't know if the, how the I is pronounced. Uh, the, the, it's translated saints. It just means, you know what? Holy ones. Look in your own Bible at 1 Corinthians 1, verse 2. 
you'll see two extra words that have been inserted into our English translations that shouldn't be there. 1 Corinthians 1 verse 2, to the church of God which is at Corinth, to those who are sanctified, set apart in Christ Jesus. You see, we are now in, I got to give the updated sermons on what it means to be in Christ. It's so vital to understand we're in Christ and we're in God the Father. It's not that just they're in us, but we're in them. So anyway, to those who are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called, it says in your Bible, to be saints, holy ones, with all who in every place call on the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, both theirs and ours. The words to be are not in the original. In my Bible, they're in italics to remind me they're not in the originals. Paul isn't saying, someday you'll be saints. Someday you might make it to the holy ones. Someday you'll be holy. No, that's not what he's saying at all. He says, to you who are sanctified in Yeshua, called holy ones. So right off the bat, Paul isn't skirting the issue of being holy. He wants them to know, you are called holy. Holy ones, saints. Uh, the word to be is not supposed to be in there. Uh, we are called set apart people. We are called holy people, sanctified people. But clearly being holy does not mean we were sinless or are sinless. Does not mean we're perfect in all our conduct? Because as you read through the book of Corinthians, 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians, you see fault after fault after fault within that church that Paul has to correct chapter by chapter by chapter. They were getting drunk at the Passover. They were suing one another. Uh, they had factions within the church in chapter 1 and so forth. So um, turn now to John 14. And, and when I get to part 2 of this message, uh, I'm going to talk very, very much about what a high calling we have. And we've just got to wake up to that. I, I, I don't think we really do. We fill our minds with this pandemic thing and we get into all the politics of it, as I have. I'm going to stop. I've I, I got to pull away from that. I'm called to be separate from the world, separate from all this. So we're supposed to be people who are filled with the very presence of God. In John 14, verse 23, Yeshua speaking, John 14, verse 23, Jesus answered and said to him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word. And my Father and I, my Father, remember in my last sermon? Start referring to God as your God, as, as, as Father in Heaven, as my Father in Heaven. So here it says, my Father and I will love Him, and we will come to Him and make our home with Him. We'll come and live inside of you. I mean, there are many, many verses in Corinthians and other places that talk about how we are now today the temple of the Holy Spirit, the temple of God's presence. So wherever God is, is holy. Wherever he is, is holy. We'll talk about it more next time, I believe. Uh, I think it's next time with, with Moses, where, where God says, hey, show a little respect. The ground you're standing on is holy because God was there. Dirt was holy. Ground was holy because God was there. It's kadosh in the Hebrew there. It's holy. So... This makes our bodies and our spirits the holy temples of God's very own presence. Oh, that you and I would live with that awareness. It's not just some vague spirit inside of us. Uh, this spirit inside of us is God. According to John 14, 23, Yeshua says, And my Father and I will love him, and we will come and make our home with him. John 14, 23. And then in 1 Corinthians 6, 17, it says, But he who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. When have you ever had a sermon on that verse? He's just talked about when you come together, you guys, you come together with some woman, whether it's your wife or in context there, he actually talks about the temple prostitutes and others. He says, when you have a coupling coming going on, how can I nicely say it? You become one flesh with that person. And then in verse 17, he says, But he who is joined to the Lord, and this is so much better, he's saying, is one spirit with him. When you couple with God and become that close to him and seek him like you would be seeking your own spouse, you become one spirit with him. That's right there in Scripture. 
Look at the context yourself. It's all there in verse 15 and 16 and then verse 17. You become one spirit. In Ephesians 2, verses 21 and 22. Ephesians 2, verses 21 and 22. Here we're, we're called the dwelling place of God or for God. Ephesians 2, verses 21 to 22. In whom, in Christ, the whole building being fitted together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. Talking about us. In whom you also, you Ephesians, you people in Kenya, you people in Canada and America and England, wherever you are, in whom you also are being built together as a dwelling place for God. Not just God's spirit, as a dwelling place for God in the spirit. We have to live our lives. We have to live our lives with much, much more awareness. I do. I do. Much, much more awareness. I'm supposed to be living a life that evidences holy God is inside of me. And we have to live a life aware that we're in a war. And our battle is not with people, it says. And I think that's Ephesians 6, but with principalities and powers and high places, demonic forces that want you to fail. And they know where I am weak. And they know where you are weak. And so they're going to be like, if you're trying to trap something, you put what is really delectable for that animal. And you make it look safe. Until the trap is sprung. Boom, boom, boom. You know, traps being sprung all over the place. And all of a sudden, you can't get away. And you're doomed. We need to wake up. We're in a war. And Satan is going to be sending all these baits, baits, B-A-I-T, a bait out to you to try to trap you, get you thinking and doing, to get you depressed, to get you angry against your spouse, against your kids, against someone else, against God. Why didn't you heal her? Why didn't you do this? Why don't you do that? Why is this happening to me? Where are you when I need you? These aren't your thoughts. They become your thoughts if you don't cast them out. But we're supposed to capture every thought that's not in captivity to Jesus Christ. I say again to all of you, my brothers and sisters, all of you, let's wake up. Let's wake up. Let's come out of this Laodiceanism. Let's come out of this lukewarmness. Let's start praying more. Let's start Bible studying more. Let's start fasting more. Will you join me with that? When was the last time you fasted? I hope you won't say it's the last day of atonement. When was the last day you fasted? Why don't we all fast together in the coming week? Just do it together. Seeking our God, repenting of not being what we should be. So anyway, these wars are going on. And my point in saying all that is that all of those who were formerly horrible sinners can be washed completely in the blood of the Lamb and washed clean and then forgiven. And then God himself, it's unbelievable to me that God himself wants to come live inside of me. But there are verses also that say, Woe to him who defiles his temple. My body is now the temple of the Holy Spirit. If I purposely defile it by sin, by uncleanness, by just stupid things, not taking care of myself, God will destroy him. There's a verse that says that, defile. I'll look it up and add that to my notes. It's not in my notes. I need to add that to my notes here. So my point is God is holy. His children are holy. That's you. How does that happen? Well, so we'll get to that in just a second. Brethren now are called holy. We've just read that. Are called saints. God's loyal angels. It says Christ is coming back with all the holy angels with him. And I'll give you the verses in my notes. One you can look at is Mark 8, 38. Luke 9, 26. Luke 9, 26. And it also says in Exodus 19, verse 6, that Yehovah Elohim, our eternal God, had set Israel apart, set apart Israel, to be what? To be his holy nation. 
We'll talk more about that next time too. But uh, you shall be a holy nation to me, he says in Exodus 19, verse 6. So even Israel, they didn't have God's Holy Spirit. But because holy God himself made the decision to consecrate them and put them on one side. And he, there's a verse that says, I've severed you from the nations. Separated, I've severed you from the nations. There's one in Ezekiel 16 where it says, I was walking along and I saw you there in the ditch. You were naked and you were covered with mud and you were just a baby. And I picked you up and I washed you. I cleaned you up and I raised you. And he's using that as an, as an example of how when he first called us, how we must be so grateful for that to live a holy life. So how do they become holy? How do angels become holy? How, does, how do brethren like you and me become holy? How did the nation of Israel become holy? The nation of Israel's case, it wasn't because God gave them the Holy Spirit, but because God set them apart and put his presence within that nation. Not in each individual, but within certain individuals like Moses and Caleb and Joshua and so on. But he was right there in the middle of the camp. He was right there. And he, had, he consecrated the people. So that made them a holy nation. I can't make myself holy and neither can you. It's God's presence or God's saying that I'm setting apart this person or this nation or these angels as consecrated to me, faithful to me. And he puts his presence with them. That's what makes us holy. I'll begin to go much more in detail into all that in part two. Paul says in Romans 4, uh, 7, 14 to 20, oh, for, for we know that the law is spiritual, but I'm carnal. Paul, the apostle Paul, years after his conversion, years after spending three years with Christ in Arabia, says, I am carnal, sold under sin. Romans 7, 14. For what I'm doing, I don't understand what I will to do. I don't practice, but what I hate, that's what I end up doing, he says. If I then do what I don't want to do, I agree with me. Uh, I agree with the law that it is good. But now it's no longer I who, who's doing the sinning. Verse 17, Romans 7, 17. But sin that dwells in me. So we have to understand that there's a war going on, a battle going on. I'll cover it in much more detail next time. Uh, where it says these war against each other. The King James, these lust against each other. And the fleshly part we still have and the spiritual. So we have a new nature from God. We still have our old nature. The old nature is not taken away. It's kept there. And these war against each other. And God wants to see us emphasize the spirit part of it. And let that be the part that wins. So in Romans 7 verses 18 to 20. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, nothing good dwells. He clarifies when he says, I know nothing good dwells in me. He says, I mean in my flesh, because in his spirit, in his spirit in man, that couples now with God's spirit, that was very good. But in the flesh, there's nothing good that dwells in me. And so um, he says, for uh, to will is present in me, Romans 7, 18. But how to perform what's good, I don't find. For the good that I want to do, I don't do. And the evil I, I, I don't want to do, that's what I practice. So there was something good in Paul. There's something good in us. Remember what I read earlier, John 14, 23. God the Father and Yeshua come and live directly inside of us. We become the temple of the Holy, Holy God of Israel. And it's his holy presence that makes us clean. Yes, even this piece of dirt that I am. And we'll turn to dirt when I die. Can be holy. So can yours. When Moses was at the burning bush... I'll just quote or refer to it in Exodus 3. You know the story. He was tending the flock there in Exodus 3. Maybe we can put it up while I'm talking about it. He was tending the flock in, out, out there in Midian. And uh, he led his flock to the backside of the desert, came to Mount Horeb, which is another name for Sinai, and uh, the mountain of God. It was called the mountain of God. The angel of Jehovah, the angel of the Lord, happened to be, appeared to him in a flame of fire from the midst of a bush. And he looked, and there was a bush burning with fire, but not burning up. It wasn't consumed. Moses says, I better turn aside to look at this. And because he does that, it starts originally with saying this was the angel of the Lord. And then in verse 4, Exodus 3, verse 4, it says, Now when Jehovah, when the Lord saw 
that he turned aside to look. God called to him, Elohim called to him from the midst of the bush, said Moses and Moses, and, and God said, don't draw near this place. Take off your sandals off your feet for the place upon which you stand is holy dirt, holy ground, because I'm here. That's how we become holy. That's how anything becomes holy. When God's presence enters it or when God himself says it's holy, I'm setting this. You'll find in part two some surprises. People who even don't have God's Holy Spirit, there are some whom God himself says are holy. Now, now I hope you'll listen to part two and, and find out who that is. If God can make dirt holy by his presence, <clears throat> He can make even you and me holy. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 7 verse 1, right after that whole section on, on come out from them and be separate for I want to be your God and you be my children and I'll be a father to you and you'll be my sons and daughters. That goes on to, in 2 Corinthians 7 verse 1. Therefore, there's a war going on. Therefore, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh. I'm saying to all of you, I'm preaching the word of God. I'm preaching to myself. God is saying, would you all please cleanse yourself from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. 2 Corinthians 7 verse 1. In 2 Peter 3 verse 11, since all these things will be dissolved, uh, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct. We don't watch stuff anymore that wouldn't please. If God were sitting right there beside you, let alone in you, if you could see Yeshua, holy son of God, sitting beside you on your couch, would you watch the things you watch? Would you go the places you go? Would you act the way you act? The way we really are when we think no one's watching, when in fact Billions of angels can see you. The four living creatures can see you. The seraphim, the cherubim, the 24 elders, and Yeshua and Jesus Christ, uh, God himself. We're never alone. If God were sitting right there beside us, would we, or walking with us, he says, I will walk among them. He says, Noah and Enoch walked with God. We should walk with God 24-7, all the time. I preach to myself. I need to do this better, too. And that's why I'm giving this sermon. I figured if I need it, you probably all need it as well. The holy conduct, 2 Peter 3.11. So we'll go into a lot, a lot more of this next time, part two. Please listen to part two. So remember, we won't see God without holiness, without which, without holiness, no one will see God. Hebrews 12, 14. Remember only God, Yeshua, who is also God in their presence and their Holy Spirit. That's ultimately all that's holy. Holiness is being selected by God and to be set apart, consecrated for his holy use. It doesn't mean we're 100% always perfect. I just read you where Paul says, he still sometimes falls down and does what he hates to do. But at least I hope you and I are growing to the point where we hate it. When we wake up and see where we're heading in our sins. We hate it. We come back and we just get on our knees and repent. When we realize our thoughts have not been holy. Our actions have not been holy. Our conduct has not been holy. In obeying all of scripture. Only God can ultimately make anything or anyone holy. We'll cover all of that, that part much more too. We can defile what's holy by dabbling with the unclean. And we are to work with God in cleansing ourselves from what's unclean. So I'll talk next time about some of the exceptions to the rule. People who don't have God's spirit, whom God says are holy. Connected to you, by the way. Watch that. How important is it to identify with the kingdom of God? We're not of this world. We're not of this kingdom. I'll have some more to say about that as well. I think I have, probably many of you have, started getting too involved in the politics of this world. This is not our world. This is not our world. And what happens, happens. And I can be aware of it, and I can 
speak out against it, but it's not ultimately my biggest concern. We're cognizant of our high calling. Uh, I want to talk to you about Rebecca and the two nations that were inside of her and what that has to do with holiness. What's a holy person really like and the war that should be going on and our part in guarding holiness. Adam was told to keep this garden. Uh, watch it, guard it. We're told to guard and keep the Sabbath holy. Keep it holy. We have to keep ourselves holy. Cleansing ourselves from uncleanness, like I just read. So let's ask God's dismissal now. Holy God in heaven, my Father, our Father, you are perfectly holy. And you've called me and those listening and thousands and thousands more to holiness. Forgive us as we slip up into works of the flesh. We don't want that because if we keep doing that as our way of life, we won't be in your kingdom. Forgive us, Father in heaven. Pour your Holy Spirit into those who are your true children, into me, into others listening to this. Just fill us with your Holy Spirit. I love the phrase where it talks about, and these certain ones were filled with the Holy Spirit. Please, Father, let that be a description that can be of us. We praise your holy name. We praise you, Yeshua. We praise you for all you've done and fill us with your spirit as you dismiss us now. Help us become more and more holy like you, perfecting holiness in the fear of the Lord. We love you. We can't believe you've called us. So many other people you could have called, but thank you for that. And we want to honor and praise you now in Yeshua's mighty name. Amen. Visit the Light on the Rock website where you can view additional videos, over 270 sermons, and 300 blogs as a scriptural study resource for those who desire to know God the Father and His Son and His incredible plan for all mankind. We are not a church, but a nonprofit organization providing in depth biblical studies free for all who would like to visit our site. The Light on the Rock Foundation also supports an orphanage in Kenya, providing financial resources to support their living costs and education. We never ask for money. However, any donations are appreciated and will be used to support the Kenyan Orphanage and our site. Thank you for visiting. And if you find these teachings beneficial to you and your family, please share with others.